Uh, okay, our next speaker is uh, Peter Kirby. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur and he's the president of Factum. Uh, he uh, spoke uh, just recently, actually, at our, our show. Was it in Singapore? Yeah, in Singapore. Yeah, I thought I recognized you. Yeah, I'm, I'm the guy with the jet lag. That's right, the guy with the jet lag. <laughs> and his, uh, his cohort, uh, Paul Snow, was actually at the show in, uh, in uh, Singapore also. You, you may have met Paul Snow before. He's not at this show. Uh, he goes to a lot of the events, and he also runs the Austin, Texas Bitcoin Conference, uh, which is March 28th to the 29th. So I think uh, Peter's going to be there helping him to organize that and also to speak. Uh, but Factum is, is basically a, a simple extension of the Bitcoin blockchain uh, that lets you uh, build faster, cost-effective apps. And uh, their aim is to build a, a data layer on top of the blockchain and bring honesty and transparent, transparency to the business. So... It's a pretty noble claim. I like that. Yeah, seriously. Well, Take it away, sir. Give fantastic. me a big round of applause. Fantastic. So uh, it's getting close to lunch, so we're going to just take a little bit of time to do this. Um, I guess the conference is running a little behind. So I want everybody to sort of shake off all that monetary policy that we had to deal with uh, in the last, um, you know, shake it off. Um, <sighs> deep breath. We're going to talk about business, something that I care very deeply about. Um, so... Everybody from Mark Andreessen to Bill Gates, um, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, everybody keeps saying that these blockchains are going to revolutionize business, right? It's the, the most amazing technology. And the question I have for you guys is, where, where exactly is the revolution, right? What, why are we not actually seeing any of these blockchain technologies actually solve real business problems? Uh, really, really kind of question mark, right? Because if it's revolutionary, why isn't it revolutionizing things? What we have in 2015 in terms of blockchain technology is slightly faster payments, slightly cheaper remittance, and it's slightly more convenient. And for all of that, we get a whole lot of regulatory headaches, fraud, and hacks, right? Which looks an awful lot like the internet in 1994. We had slightly faster bulletin board systems and slightly cheaper books and a lot of regulatory um, issues and hacks and fraud, right? So why are we stuck? What is wrong with our existing blockchain technology that's basically preventing big businesses, governments, institutions for jumping on this technology and actually doing some revolution? So couple issues. First, there's a huge, huge scalability problem, right? Anybody who knows the Bitcoin blockchain knows that you're sort of stuck with a one megabyte block limit. Gavin's working on a slightly increased uh, plan, but that translates to seven transactions a second, right? Which is way, 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 way too little to do any kind of business on it. Zynga took a look at uh, blockchain for their micropayments for their games, and they're like, we do seven transactions in like a microsecond. This is insane. Right, so there's a big scalability problem. The other problem is we're trying to take all these business concepts and shove them into a coin-shaped hole. Right, so every blockchain technology that exists right now is basically built around a coin. If you want to build a smart contract with Counterparty or Ethereum, it's really cool that you can do the smart contract part, but you've got to take your problem and shove it into a coin. And coins tend to be fungible, which is very difficult for data. And then finally, this is the face that every corporate lawyer in America and in the EU makes when they think about cryptocurrency because it's regulatory messy and they just don't know what to do with it. They're like, the risks are way, way, way too high for the you know, limited things that we can do with it, right? So I'm gonna make a plug for what we're up to, but then we're gonna jump right into real business use cases and things you can actually do with blockchains now, today and try to give you guys some ideas of what we can do next and what you can do to move your business onto the blockchain and think about how to make some money with it. So what do we, what's the point of Factum? Well, we wanted to solve this bloat problem, right? It's a really big deal. There's not enough blockchain to go around. We wanted to do data instead of coins. We wanted you to think about your problem as a data problem on the blockchain instead of as a coin problem on the blockchain. 
And then finally, we wanted this concept of cryptocurrency isolation. We want to basically separate the cryptocurrency, you know, the guts of the system, from the actual user experience. So a bank never has to touch a cryptocurrency, an insurance company never has to hold a wallet. So that was kind of what we're trying to do with this factum thing. And what we did is we basically created this blank piece of paper, right? <laughs> factum is basically a blank piece of paper that you write once and you never erase. It creates a data layer on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Write anything you want, any kind of data structure, any kind of information, any kind of hash. You just can never, ever, ever erase it. Paul Snow likes to say Factum does practically nothing, which is a wonderful marketing line. <laughs> but that lets you basically do anything. Right? The, the best technologies in the world are like TCP IP and HTTP are really, really simple, but they let you do really powerful things. So that's my plug for what we're up to. Um, the other thing that Factum lets you do is um, the users, the, the institutions, the governments, the big banks, um, only ever have to touch entries and entry credits, which are totally software. So they never ever have to touch a Bitcoin, they never have to touch a cryptocurrency, they never have to touch a Ripple or an Ether or any of that kind of stuff. Right, so when we talk to big institutions, that solves that yucky lawyer face for them. You know, that's, that's really the goal, right? So I'm gonna jump right into some interesting projects that we're working on, and uh, the very first one is uh, land titles. So I was down in Central America. Believe it or not, that's what a title record looks like through most of the developing world. This is a, a real one in a Central American country that we're working with. Um, you can see, you could probably see the scribbles, but basically it's just like whoever's property got recorded and then the next person's property gets recorded right after that, right? And they have, whoops, they have just books and books and books of those, right? It's a, it's a fire hazard waiting to happen. <laughs> um, so what happened was the World Bank spent an awful lot of money to digitize title records and as soon as some government officials with God powers on that database um, had access to it, they granted themselves some beachfront property, right? Because a database is only secure uh, it, as, you know, whoever has God powers on it, whoever has root access. And when you're talking about land title, you're talking about all of the wealth in the entire country at their fingertips to be stolen. So um, the country reached out to us because they're looking for basically a tamper-proof record. And, um, and this brings up one of the really core concepts of what we can do with blockchain technology. We can make immutable ledgers, write once, never unwrite. And that's a really, really big deal for systems of record like title, right? Because if it's tamper-proof and I know exactly what happened to a record at every step along the way, nobody can steal it, right? And if they try to, now I've got proof and I can catch them. So this is a really fundamental concept, giving all data systems an immutability, a, a, an immutable ledger to write to, basically makes much more powerful data systems. It solves that fundamental problem with data, which is it's only as secure as the secure computer is. Right? So um, what that looked like, like I said, the World Bank spent like $100 million to digitize the title records, a bunch of corrupt officials, uh, changed records of the database, and it was a huge political scandal. In fact, the um, party in power got voted out because it was such a scandal. So, with immutable ledgers, we're able to build them a tamper-proof title record, um, and one of the other things we can do is because we can look at ev uh, the records through every step of their life, from the point where the attorney submits it, through everybody who touches that record, we can uh, prevent the garbage in problem, which is another you know, sort of fundamental problem with record keeping. So immutable ledgers, really awesome blockchain technology concept. Um, we're playing around with it in Factum. Obviously there are other people who are looking at that too. But um, when you think blockchain technology, stop thinking faster payments and start thinking immutable ledgers. That's gonna lead you down much more valuable roads. Um, the next one I'm gonna talk about is uh, this concept of transparency versus privacy, right? And in the EU, this is a really big deal because frankly, I'm sure you guys are all sick of NSA looking at everything you do, right? Because it's not fair. Just because it's data on the internet doesn't mean the NSA has rights to it, right? So um, 
Transparency versus privacy is gonna be one of the most important questions of the 21st century, and it is solved with blockchain technology, right? The, the fundamental tools that make cryptology possible means that I can take all the identity documents, your driver's license, your birth certificate, your passport, your bank records, everything you need, I can take all that information, I can hash it into a unique hash, and then that hash can be shared with every institution that needs to know who you are. If, you, if they need to know your birthday, that's one thing. They don't need to be able to know everything about you in order to prove when you were born, right? And that's kind of the way we think about identity now. You need to verify somebody's ID at a club or a bar. Suddenly you know where they live also because you're looking right at their driver's license. So blockchain technology lets you do this balance between transparency, it's a global public ledger, and privacy. Right, it's only as, you only reveal as much as you want. And there's this whole series of revealable secrets that you can do, so you can give people a little information that proves that you have the rest of the information without giving it all away, right? And so we're working on a project right now to actually build a, a data haven, um, which is a really interesting concept because with um, blockchain technology, you can really actually watch every packet and know um, you know, to build an immutable ledger of where all those packets go. So, um, really, really interesting concept. I know Switzerland's been looking at it. I know the EU cares very deeply about it for their ID project. And um, frankly, all of us should care because we don't want the NSA spying on everything we do. Um, so, yes, when you think about blockchain technology, I want you to think about finally solving that transparency versus privacy thing, right? That's another path that will lead you down and make you lots of money. Um, finally, I want to talk about this distributed autonomous ledger concept. So the really, really cool thing that we can do with blockchain technology is we can build a ledger that is spread entirely across the globe but not owned by anybody, right? So this is really, really fascinating. Um, we're working on a project to do basically uh, shipping containers, right? There's 100 million shipping containers. No, actually, I think there's probably 200 million shipping containers in the world. And really, we don't know where most of them are. We've got some idea they're on a ship somewhere. Maybe they're in a loading dock somewhere. But if you built a autonomous distributed ledger and basically tagged every shipping container and had it dial into home or had people like basically you know, ping wherever they were, um, you could know conceivably where all 200 million are. And you could really think about building um, like an Uber for shipping containers where a shipping container was ready just in time. You knew exactly when it was unloaded. You knew exactly when it was um, basically ready to go. And because you could put it in an autonomous distributed ledger that's not owned by anybody, that information doesn't have to be controlled by a central authority. Right now there are six companies that basically control all the shipping containers in the world and they charge you exactly what they want, right? It's basically a cartel. So you can really think about any um, asset management built on a distributed autonomous ledger um, spread across the globe is a really, really powerful thing that you can do with blockchain technology. You can do it for telecom, you can do it for, um, you know, insurance uh, uh, assets, you can do it for basically anything where you've got a, you need to do a central database of a lot of people's stuff. So when you think about blockchain technology for business, you can think about what can I do with a distributed autonomous ledger that's not owned by anybody, and, and how can I build that to solve my business problem? So um, basically, you know, those are a couple core concepts uh, you know, as a plug for Factum, we're obviously working on a lot of this stuff, and, and these are real projects that we're, you know, in process of building out with partners. Uh, we'll be able to make more announcements of those later this year. But um, this, is, this is sort of, this is where blockchain can, technology can be. We can take it to solve real business problems. We can get past all of that yucky cryptocurrency feeling and regulatory nonsense. We can get past this scalability problem, we can get past trying to shove your particular business problem into a coin-shaped hole. So um, I'm gonna open it up for questions, um, and uh, I think, how are we doing on time? I still have a couple minutes for some questions. Okay, That's great, great. So we're gonna open it up for questions, and then Stuart's gonna cut me off so we can all have some lunch. Questions, don't be shy.
Raise your hand. Flavien, you have a question? Tu as une question? I'm trying to speak French to get him to ask a question. Okay. Hey, so um, uh, the f is, is it necessary to use factoids to use factum or because there is this currency, the factoids, is it, is it possible to use factum without that? Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, factum, so in order to have a distributed autonomous system, you have to have some payment mechanism within it. So that's sort of like the guts of Factum uses these tokens we call factoids. They're just software tokens and we use them to pay out the hardware. What's nice is we put all those guts in a box or in like a person, right? We don't really look nearly as attractive as our, if our guts were on the outside. And all the users, all the businesses, all the governments, all the institutions only have to interact with entry credits. So you basically an entry credit is a non-transferable right to enter some data into Factum. And because of that, that's how we isolate out the cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency just stays within the hardware backbone, you know, pays out the network. Users only have to deal in entry credits. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so uh, right here, Micah. Sorry, there's a blinding <laughs> light here, so. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit how the, the federation works in Factum um, in terms of uh, how these local chains are run? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit technical about Factum. Um, basically, Factum, we use a pool of, I think right now it looks like it's going to be 32 federated servers, and there's another 32 uh, real-time audit servers. Um, and those are just the servers that collect, you know, basically Factum collects and organizes data. So those are the servers that basically do that. They collect and organize the data. Uh, round robin, one out of those 32 places a Merkle root, so like a, a, a hash of all the hashes, um, into the Bitcoin blockchain um, once every 10 minutes. So it basically creates like an anchor. Um, so those federated servers use a, a consensus algorithm called Raft. Um, don't ask me to explain how consensus algorithm Raft works, but there's a white paper about it. Um, <laughs> but basically, they all agree to the data um, we use a small amount of those federated servers because uh, that makes it much, much faster. And those federated servers are chosen by the users of the system. Basically, all those people with entry credits get to consistently vote for who gets to be those federated servers. So it's totally autonomous, um, and there's a built-in voting mechanism, so if there's any bad actors, they basically get voted off the island. Uh, did I miss somebody? Oh, yeah, front. Hans, Hans, Lombardo, Hans, sorry, Hans Lombardo from All Coins News. Um, when are you going to do your crowd sale? Are you still going to do it on Coinify? Or yeah, okay, so okay. lots of questions about Factum. Yeah. Um, so Factum's doing a crowd sale. Uh, that's how we basically get those uh, factoids out in the world and how we basically establish what their value is for all of the, uh, peop all of the servers that basically get paid in them. Crowd sale is going to be end of March now. Uh, we are going to make some more announcement at the Texas Bitcoin Conference. So if any of you guys um, would like to come to beautiful Austin, Texas, I highly recommend it. Um, and yes, Coinify, what, what Coinify is doing, for those of you who don't know, Coinify is basically cleaning up the uh, crowd sale industry. They're basically doing all the due diligence, and then they've got basically a roadmap that uh, they pay out those tokens to. So instead of projects that basically are give us a bunch of money and maybe someday we'll deliver software. Coinify is basically saying, we're gonna hold the software company to its timeline. In fairness, Factum is in an alpha now. Uh, beta is looking probably end of crowd sale. Um, some of the things you do, like the land titles and the ideas, um, remind me of the BitNation project. Are you familiar with that? Are they a competitor or do you, do you know them? Uh, what do you think of them? BitNation? Oh, uh, BitNation. Um, what's her name? Stephanie, is that right? Susanna. Susanna, thank you. Susanna and I have had a couple conversations. She's a really wonderful woman. Uh, Susanna, uh, there are a lot of people looking at the same sort of core concepts. They're taking a very different approach than we are. They're trying to go directly to the citizens, which I think is awesome. Um, this is basically the Hernando de Soto model. Go to the citizens, give them tools to make their own title records so they don't have to deal with the government. We're basically saying, governments of the world, let us help you make your systems better. So we've got basically a different approach. I, I wouldn't consider us competitors. If, You're if less anarchist. 
What's that? You're less anarchist than them. <laughs> I'm probably less anarchist than most of the people in the room. So I, I, I was brought up by securities lawyers. <laughs> In the back? Yep. Hi, uh, Trent McConaughey, uh, Berlin. I, I guess my question is two parts, and the second question will be dependent on the first. Uh, when you talk about uh, privacy versus security, uh, does this, I, I'm just trying to imagine there's a few different ways to do it, but are you basically uh, storing the data in your documents in an encrypted form, and then the user has a private key to decrypt the documents? Oh yeah, so, so the whole idea behind Factum is, Factum is a sort of expensive way to store all your data, so what we expect people to do is hash it. Um, so you're gonna probably, if you're, if you're a big bank using Factum, you're gonna keep all your private stuff private and hash that data, put the data into the ledger and that basically that hash is gonna prove that it existed at that point in time and then you're gonna follow that data through. So um, people are just gonna use Factum, like you said, as a sort of tool for storing this crypto cryptographic proof. Um, at the application layer, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff you can do there to say, I have this information, we call it revealable secrets, but I have this information, I can prove it without showing you the whole information by doing like a, a random uh, amount of those data packets and basically prove beyond reasonable doubt that that, that data exists for you. I can also say, um, I can prove that that's the ID, but, I, but you want to verify the birth, uh, the birthday, I'm going to send you just the birthday. So there's a bunch of things you can do with the application layer to make transparency and privacy balance for exactly your situation. Obviously, a bank has different privacy versus uh, transparency laws than, let's say, a, uh, like a title record does. Right, right. Okay, yeah. So I think you, actually you've probably addressed if you guys or even the application layer isn't storing the document. My main concern is, you know, as Moore's law progresses, as hashing algorithms get, um, people work on, um, sorry, encrypt, uh, security, um, you know, 20 years from now, if the stuff is stored, of course, you've got real problems because of, you know, cryptographic advances, Moore's law. But if no one's storing, that's not a problem. So thank you. Okay, great. Awesome, yeah. I was afraid he was gonna ask me a question about hashing algorithms. I was like, uh, <laughs> they work? Yes, good. Hi, Peter, Sebastian, Epson, Bitcoin. Hi, um, so I had a question about, um, so you mentioned some examples, but they're sort of large scale examples. Uh, will you guys be writing some sort of like APIs or developer platform tools so that um, one can develop, say like iPhone apps for verifying documents? and. So my second question is sort of relating to what he asked. Um, for the storage part of the documents, yeah. uh, you could rely on some central server or something like that. Um, how could Factum plug in with some sort of a decentralized file storage system to ensure the safety of those files? Let me, ask this, let me answer the second question second. Or let me ask the se second question first. Um, so we, we love storage and made safe. Those are the best uh, current examples of decentralized storage. Um, we have relationships with both of them and I fully expect people to build really interesting decentralized applications using a combination of factum for the verification validation layer and storage or made safe for the storage of those documents. Um, now, the reason I asked the sec answer the second question first is because I forgot the first question. Ask me that one more time real quick. So if, if uh, Factum has or is planning to release uh, developer tools or... Oh, yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so libraries. Factum right now has an alpha of the API. You can go use it right now. Um, it's running on the Bitcoin test network. Um, we're building, we're actively building a better sort of developer on-ramp for it because this is a really big deal. We want people, Factum succeeds when a thousand businesses are built on top of it or a hundred thousand, right? If we're talking about uh, iPhone apps and, and other you know, uh, s smaller applications. So we want to make it really, really, really simple to use. It's open source, it's uh, MIT licensed, so you can build IP on top of it. Um, and it's basically built to be super developer friendly. Really, like, like Paul says, Factum does practically nothing. There's four API calls that you probably use. Um, they're like read and write, essentially. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to make it very, very easy for people to develop anything on top of it. 
Ferdinando, um, your description of blockchain technology without a coin kind of remind me of Ripple, like, you know, they disguise their coin and they provide a public ledger for yeah. financial transaction. You're talking about all kind of information, but is this similar or how much is different? So, um, yeah, there's an awful lot of really cool blockchain technologies, Ripple, Ethereum, um, counterparty, you know, a lot of these things that we're talking about in blockchain technology, but like you said, those are coins, right? You know, in order to use Ethereum, you have to use some combination of ether and gas and frame it as a smart contract built around a coin. In order to use counterparty, you have to tie your asset to a coin, right? So, Factum is very different. Factum is just a, a ledger to write data into. Um, the only reason there's any cost at all is because otherwise you could spam the system, you could do denial of service with it. So the, you know, an entry credit's gonna cost like a tenth of a penny. But basically it's a ledger that you pay a tiny, tiny fraction of them to write to and you can just never unwrite it. And we let you do, I mean, it's data, right? You can write anything. Um, hash is a really good example as somebody brought up earlier because you were gonna wanna keep your private data private as a public ledger. but. Um, if you want to write hello world into Factum, you can do that. If you want to write all sorts of metadata around that hash, you can do that. So it never forces you to think of your problem as a coin problem. It allows you to think of it as, you know, an extension to a database or an extension to an application that just writes data. Cool. Great talk. I really enjoyed it. Did you, okay. do you guys have any more questions? Is there a final question? No? Fantastic. Let's have All lunch. Right. Big round of applause. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.